Peter, I've been fascinated by the laws of nature. It is the assumption of scientists that it's constant for all times and all places. We start out with that. Is that true? Because there are some people now talking about that over long times of universal history, some of the constants of nature may change. Yeah, it's, in, it's conceivable. I mean, we don't know. We can look back in time. It's harder to look forward in time. And it's certainly very hard to look forward over you know, trillions of years in the future. And it could be uh, that that physical laws evolve and with time, that maybe the charge of the electron <laughs> gradually decays, something like that. Um, some of these are probably far-fetched thoughts, but who knows? We don't know. Um, and certainly that possibility means that predicting the ultimate fate of the universe is a bit tricky, because mm. although we can predict it fairly accurately on the basis of our current knowledge of physical laws and the, um, the, the values of the fundamental constants, if, those, if, if the laws go berserk, then who knows what will happen. Well, if we start back that as scientists, what, what, what is the fundamental principle about the constancy of law? That, that seems to be built into yeah. our uh, fundamental axioms of how you do science. Yeah. Well, I think it's, um, I mean, you have to be careful what, about what you mean by a scientific law. And in my view, and others might dispute this, I mean, my view is that a scientific law is just a summary of observation. So it's a summary of behavior that you you make a lot of observations on, for example, an electron, and you find a consistency of behavior, and you encapsulate that consistency in a statement, which is what you call a law. Um, so so it, 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 in one sense, it sounds the same, but in another sense, there's a subtle difference, which is a fundamental difference in that the law is not something existing in its own right and then it being expressed Absolutely. in different ways. Absolutely. But yes. the law is a way of describing a, a, a series of behaviors that, that, that seem yeah. similar. I, so, so laws are commentaries mm. on, and what you then do, you construct theories, um, accounting for those laws. And, um, so there's several layers of discussion in, in, in science, really. And I think the, um, it begins with experiment, with observation observation under controlled conditions that enables you to formulate this summary of behavior, the law. And then you develop a theory, or you, you make a guess yeah. about what the reason might be. You call that a hypothesis. And then if, you, if your hypothesis rings true, then you construct a, a theory, which is often a mathematically rigid theory. But I mean, I mean, the, and even those theories are evolving, and and um, it at the moment we have so quantum theory on one hand, which is a marvelously successful theory for uh, d the discussion discussing macroscopic matter, and we've got um, general relativity on the other hand. But those two have got to come together, and we know that there's going to be a a kind of a tectonic plate collision <laughs> of these two when they come together. And almost certainly we will get a, a whole new world view emerging from it. Mm -hmm. So I think there, there are, there's evolution of law and evolution of law. Uh, evolution of law in the sense that quantum theory can't be right on its own. Gravitation, general relativity can't be right on their own. So they're going to change and our deep understanding of the world is going to change. But um, if you've got a, a decent law, which with um, fundamental constants built in, do those fundamental constants evolve and change the consequences of the, of the law? So there's various levels at which these things could could evolve. What, what are some examples for in chemistry of of uh, a, a law being a descriptor, a commentary on on, on behavior? Ooh, well, the second law of thermodynamics is um, one example, um, and or the first law of thermodynamics, effectively the conservation of energy. I mean, those are laws that um, have been built up through experience, through both chemistry and physics. And, and, and specifically, how would that, how do you come to that from what set of data? Um, 
the, the, the second law originally emerged from observations on steam engines mm. and thinking about how to improve their efficiency. Mm. Um, the, the first law really emerged from um, studies of the conversion of heat into work and work in, in, into heat. The first law being the, the, the conservation, conservation of, of energy. More or less the conservation yeah. of energy, right. yeah, with knobs on. But, but right. So these are very kind of very practical things yeah. in the real world. Yeah. Well, Making that's steam what, engines more efficient, looking yeah. at gases. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, that's what science is about, basically. Um, more recondite laws. I'm having difficulty in thinking of, um, I suppose, yes, um, Faraday's laws of electrolysis, mm. that um, you get so much mass for so much electric current mm. and so on. Those are slightly more laboratory-based, rather more distant laws. Uh, so they were, they were established by careful measurements on, on, um, on, um, on, on electrolytic cells and so on. I think, um, chemistry became a part of the physical sciences with all the power that that represents when measurements started to be made on substances. And I suppose you could trace that back to people like Lavoisier, who you know, weighed things. <laughs> and so um, once you can attach numbers to matter, then you acquire power much greater than the alchemists ever had. <laughs> and you can begin to formulate quantitative laws. And I suppose it's the moment when Lavoisier started to weigh things in his laboratory that chemistry became a part of the physical sciences. The biological sciences became part of the physical sciences when the structure of DNA was established.